So it's one o'clock. I think we'll um, get started. Uh, welcome everybody and thanks for joining us today. Um, my name is Joanne Bryant uh, and I am chairing today's meeting. Um, and we are um, holding this seminar today um, to mark World Hepatitis Day, uh, which is happening this week. Uh, and I'm going to kick us off with um, acknowledging countries. I want to acknowledge that we're all on Aboriginal land. Uh, and I am on the country of the Bedigo people today, uh, who are the traditional owners of the lands and waterways of the um, area now known as Kensington in Sydney. Uh, and I pay my respects to elders past and present of the Bedigo people. Um, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. And I invite you to um, acknowledge the country that you're on today by using the chat function. Um, so just a few notes of housekeeping before we get started. So we're using um, uh, just your regular Zoom meeting platform today. It's not a webinar um, platform. So this means um, that I'll ask you all to please keep your microphones muted. Uh, and also to uh, let you know that any um, chat will come out in the recording, uh, and that includes person-to-person -person chat. Um, so we have um, a great list of speakers for you today. We're going to start with uh, Dr. Tim Brody, who's going to uh, present some of the newest data from the Stigma Indicators uh, project, which many of you will know about, and that's some. Um, uh, a project that monitors um, uh, stigma in the population. And uh, Tim's going to present the latest data about hepatitis C stigma. And this will be followed by um, Associate Professor Lauren Brenner, who's got some very interesting qualitative and quantitative data about um, some of the most recent research on hepatitis B. Uh, followed by Carla Trelor, who will be um, running through very interesting uh, and innovative output from a recent study about hepatitis C treatment called Vital Voices. And we'll finish off with Dr. Um, Jake Ratz, who's going to be launching the center's annual report of trends in behavior, the 2022 edition. Uh, so I'm hoping we'll have a, a few minutes for questions at the end of the session, uh, but if you'd like to put your questions in the chat as we move through, um, then you can do that and I will do my best to curate them uh, and we'll see how much time we have at the end of the session. So uh, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Find my cursor, there we go. Uh, and I'm gonna hand over to Tim who's going to uh, run us through some of the stigma indicator stuff. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, Joanne. Um, so as Joanne said, I'm just going to share a bit about the latest results we have from the Stigma Indicators Monitoring Project, uh, particularly looking around hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and people who inject drugs. Um, and Lauren's going to be talking more about some of the in-depth, more in-depth work we've been doing with hepatitis B. So there's just a little bit of a taste up for that in what I'm presenting um, before going on to a bit more around um, hep C and injecting drug use. Um, so for those of you who may not be aware of the project, the background to this stigma indicators project aligns with the national strategies for bloodborne viruses and STIs, where across all of them, there's a very clear goal to eliminate the negative impact of stigma, discrimination and legal and human rights issues on people's health. So this project was developed to uh, essentially monitor those experiences of stigma in, and discrimination and to be able to report progress against those key national strategies. So to understand where, how we monitor this, uh, we periodically conduct surveys of um, a range of different population groups um, and we have these single item measures to as an indicator of stigma across these different surveys. Um, so you can see on the slide here, the top item is looking at people with, um, with lived experience and looking at their lived experience of stigma and discrimination, asking in the last 12 months, have you experienced any stigma or discrimination uh, in relation to either hepatitis B, hepatitis C, injecting drug use as the um, particular ones we're looking at today. Uh, but this is a, a much broader project where we have a range of other conditions, identities, um, 
and behaviors where we, we monitor stigma and discrimination. This is just the focus of what we'll be talking about today. Uh, and as well as that, we also uh, conduct surveys with the general public and healthcare workers looking at the expression of stigma and the indicator for that expressed stigma is there at the bottom of the screen, asking people whether they would behave negatively towards other people because of hepatitis B, hepatitis C and injecting drug use. We also have a couple of other follow-up questions, which I'll um, briefly touch on as we go through some of the results, but these are really the main indicator items that, um, that we look at. So in terms of people living with hepatitis B, this is um, an area where we're um, starting to expand the work a little bit more. Um, and Lauren will talk about the um, work with uh, people living with hepatitis B, um, those communities in more detail. From the Stigma Indicators Project, uh, we have far more data around the expression of stigma towards hepatitis B. And that's what I've got up here on this slide. So you can see in our latest survey with the general public, around 50% um, have indicated that to some extent, they would behave negatively towards people living with hepatitis B. Looking then at the, the middle row, uh, the most recent data coming out of healthcare workers, it's a smaller proportion, but we still have about one in three healthcare workers reporting that behave negatively towards hepatitis B. Uh, and then that final line, again, looking at healthcare workers, we asked in the last 12 months, um, how often they'd witnessed their colleagues behaving negatively towards people because of hepatitis B. And you can see that's uh, quite uh, well aligned with uh, the expression of stigma themselves, uh, with 35% saying that they'd witnessed some negative behavior towards people living with hep B uh, from their colleagues within the past 12 months. So moving on now to look at people living with hepatitis C. Um, this is our most recent data in relation to people who've been diagnosed with hepatitis C and the extent to which they experience stigma within the last 12 months. Uh, and this sample is a subsample from a, a larger survey of people who inject drugs, uh, but particularly focused on those who um, had been diagnosed with hepatitis C. So over our past two rounds, with data collected in 2021 and uh, previously in 2018, uh, you can see just over half of both of those um, samples reporting that within the past 12 months, they'd experienced stigma in relation to hepatitis C. Uh, very similar results from 2018 to 2021, really no discernible change across any of the um, response options there. One of the follow-up questions we uh, typically ask is whether healthcare workers, workers treated them negatively or differently to others because of hepatitis C. Um, and again, it's, it's quite similar, and if anything, a slightly higher proportion from the previous indicator item um, reporting any negative treatment within the past 12 months. So 58% reporting that uh, healthcare workers treated them differently or negatively um, because they had hepatitis C. Looking then at the other surveys of the expressed stigma towards people living with hepatitis C, um, and you'll, you might notice that these um, these percentages look quite similar to what I just reported um, around hepatitis B. So from our general public survey, again, 50% of people saying they would behave negatively towards people because of their hepatitis C. And for healthcare workers, it's a slightly smaller, but um, yeah, still over, um, still around that one in three mark with um, yeah, 36% saying they would behave negatively towards people with hep C um, and 38% saying that they had witnessed that behavior from their colleagues within the past 12 months. As I mentioned, this was the people living with hep C uh, was a subsample of a broader survey of people who inject drugs. Um, and so within that, we also asked specifically about people's experience of stigma in relation to injecting drug use. And again, comparing our 2021 and 2018 data, um, you can see between the two time points, not a um, significant, not much noticeable change between those two times, um, but much, much larger proportion um, reporting any past year stigma and discrimination. Um, with yeah, over 80% at both time points. Uh, and it's also worth highlighting up the, the far end of the, those scales in the orange and the red, um, you know, 27%, 28% reporting that this had either often or always happened to them within the past 12 months. So really quite high levels of stigma being reported in relation to injecting drug use. Looking at whether healthcare workers treated them negatively or differently to others because of their injecting drug use, um, slightly, lower proportions compared to the overall stigma indicator, but still very, very high. Um, and again, between 2018 and 2021, not really much 
uh, change going on there. So by our most recent data, 75% have reported that um, healthcare workers have treated them negatively within the past 12 months. And that's uh, quite well reflected, uh, similar to what we're seeing then in terms of the express stigma from our other surveys. 78% um, of the general public reporting they behave negatively towards people who inject drugs. Um, and up to, that's up to about a third of that uh, sample saying that they would behave negatively uh, either often or always. Um, and again, with healthcare workers, close to 70% reporting they would behave negatively towards people who inject drugs. Um, and uh, just over 60% saying that they had witnessed, actively witnessed colleagues behaving negatively towards people who inject drugs. Um, and then just one final thing I wanted to throw into this uh, quick whirlwind tour over our most recent results. You know, we often talk about um, in this project how we monitor stigma and um, you know, there's always a discussion about what that means. And in our most recent survey, we asked people um, what they had done in order to avoid negative treatment within healthcare settings, which is what we've got up here on this slide. So over the last 12 months, in order to avoid being treated negatively or differently by health services, how often have you done any of the following, whether it's delayed health care or look for alternative services, not attended follow-up appointments, all of these things um, reflecting an engagement with healthcare. And you can see we've, uh, across each of these items, we've got between 70 to 75% of participants saying that they had done um, each of these to some extent over the past 12 months. So this data is really starting to show very clearly um, what those negative implications are for people experiencing or expecting to experience stigma and discrimination within the healthcare setting. So just to quickly uh, wrap all of that up, um, what we're seeing from the Indicators Project over the last couple of years is that stigma and discrimination really uh, still continue to be um, quite common experiences, uh, including sizable proportions of healthcare workers and the general public who admit that or report that they would behave negatively towards these population groups. It's not just people saying, I've experienced it. We're also getting quite high reports and common reports of people saying they would behave negatively. In the absence of any wide ranging interventions to date, um, we're not seeing any discernible change between 2018 and 2021, things are still looking quite similar. So um, the evidence that we're collecting all of this data is really pointing to um, a, a very particular and high, high need for wide ranging intervention initi initiatives to be developed and implemented in order to reduce stigma towards people living with hepatitis B, hepatitis C and people who inject drugs. Uh, both generally in the community and also particularly within healthcare settings. And I'll hand back over. Thanks. Thanks, Tim. Um, really important data coming from um, the Stigma Indicators Monitoring Project. Thank you very much. Uh, Lauren, I'll hand over to you now. Okay. Thanks, Jan. I'm just going to share my screen. Is that working for everyone? Yep, we can see it. It's not on full screen. Okay. Is that on full screen? Not yet. Oh, yes, there we go. Okay. Thank you. Right. <laughs> At least it worked. I think it's the first time it's worked for me. Um, so thank you for that. And um, I just wanted to, before I start, acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands that we're we'll meeting on today. Um, I know we're all coming from different lands, Aboriginal lands. Um, so I just wanted to pay my, um, acknowledge that and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Stigma Indicators project that Tim was um, discussing, but I'm going to focus specifically on our um, hep B arm, which we uh, we started about two years ago. Um, I've got quite a long presentation, so some of it I might um, go through quite briefly. Please feel free to ask questions about the presentation or to email me if there's in time today to discuss anything in more detail. So my presentation is, a we've got both quantitative survey-based data and qualitative interview data with two different groups of people. Um, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the survey data, where we looked at knowledge, attitudes and understandings of Hep B amongst Vietnamese and Chinese people um, in Australia. So the reason we chose Chinese and Vietnamese um, communities was um, partly because we were 
kind of directed um, to choose those two groups by our advisory group um, because we know that hep B prevalence is high amongst those groups and also because they're fairly large migrant groups to Australia. We could also network into them and, and conduct our research. Um, we con <coughs> collected survey data using both hard copies and online surveys. We had fantastic help from our um, state-based viral hep and multicultural organizations in four states. Um, and we also had fantastic researchers of Chinese and Vietnamese background who assisted with data collection and advertising to various social media channels. And participants had a choice of completing the survey in either traditional or simplified Chinese, in Vietnamese or in English. So um, we did find some differences, and I just want to note this, that we found some dif differences between those who completed the online versus the hard copy. I won't go into in too much detail. Um, I forgot to mention our overall sample sizes, which we were very excited because they're pretty large samples. Um, in the Vietnamese sample, we had over 1,027 participants, and in the Chinese sample, we had 1,050. Um, and just to highlight, in terms of the differences between the online versus the hard copy, the online were, as most people would expect, younger than the um, those who completed the hard copy, and they were more likely to speak English as opposed to those who did the hard copy. And I guess the reason I just put this slide up is also to point out how important it is to use uh, different mechanisms um, for data collection um, because it targets different, different um, communities of people. So I'm going to talk about the Vietnamese general community data first. Um, so this is just an overview of where they came from and, and what the group looked like. Um, Again, I'm just going to flick through the slide and get on to the, to the more interesting information. So we asked participants about knowing someone with Hep B and about receiving information on Hep B. So of this group of over a thousand um, people of Vietnamese background, 37% or 370 people reported that they personally knew someone who had Hep B. 90% had received some form of information about Hep B. And the most common source was on the internet or via friends and colleagues or in a newspaper or magazines. 64% or 652 reported that they had been tested for Hep B and testing was higher amongst those participants who completed the survey online. The main reason given for testing was that it was part of a regular health check and most commonly reported site of testing was at a clinic or hospital. Encouragingly, 73% reported that they were either satisfied or very satisfied with the information they were given about um, Hep B at the time of testing. Um, and what was also very interesting is of the 213 participants who reported that they had never been tested for Hep B, the reason given was that they were feeling quite well and they didn't think it was necessary to be tested. And this is something that a theme that cuts across all our qualitative and quantitative data that people feel well so they don't see a need to get tested. In terms of Hep B vaccination for this group, 63% reported being vaccinated for Hep B. Again, this number was higher for participants who completed the survey online, quite substantially higher. Um, and the majority of participants reported that they'd completed the full course of vaccination and just over half had received their vaccinations in Australia. So within this group of um, Vietnamese people living in Australia, we had 35 participants who reported that they were living with Hep B. So we, we did a little bit of extra analysis on these 35, and it's just a small group, um, but 17 of them said that they saw their GP or specialist every six to 12 months for monitoring of their Hep B. Most of them saw doctors that spoke, spoke both English and Vietnamese, and this is important because people obviously feel comfortable going to, to medical professionals of a, a similar cultural background to them. 14 of, them, uh, uh, 14 of the health workers had advised participants to take pharmaceutical medicines for their Hep B, and no doctors advised taking traditional medicines. And you'll see this is different to the Chinese sample when we get there. Um, the main concern for people living with Hep B 
was to, to in telling other people about their hep B was worries about being isolated from people as a result of having hep B. So we also included um, an interesting measure looking at trust in medicine. And what you can see from this measure is that there was a, a, a fair degree of mistrust around Western medical practices. We asked items like, I feel that Western trained doctors and health workers act as if I if I'm not to be trusted because of my cultural background. And what you can see for all of these items is about 40 to 50% for a majority of them um, indicated uh, that, sorry, not to, it's slightly less because of the neutral, but about 30 to 40% indicated that they didn't trust or, or disagreement with the, or agreement with these items. So then we asked a question about attitudes towards hepatitis B. And of the 15 of the 35 participants who had hep B had never experienced stigma or discrimination in relation to their hep B. That's what they reported. However, when the entire sample was asked if they had hep B, would they expect to experience stigma or discrimination? 36% responded that sometimes they thought they would and a further 20% thought that they would often experience stigma and discrimination. So this over 50% actually thought that they would experience stigma or discrimination around hep B. Their own attitudes towards other people with hep B um, was interesting because 64% felt that people who have hep B should not be isolated by family and friends. However, 34% reported that if they knew someone had hep B, they would avoid close contact with them. 53% felt that screening or testing for hep B is necessary for job applications, and this would prevent transmission to other employees. And 17%, which was still 169 people, felt that people who have hep B should be ashamed of their illness. So clearly there's some work that needs to be done around attitudes towards people with hep B. And the last slide for the Vietnamese community, just a little bit of um, information on knowledge. Um, knowledge was quite inconsistent. While 85% knew there was a vaccine that can prevent hep B infection, only 26% were aware that there was pharmaceutical medicines available to treat hep B. Um, and while 88% knew that hep B was a virus, over two thirds of the sample thought that hep B was caused by a damage or weak liver drinking too much alcohol or contaminated food or water or utensils. Additionally, over two thirds of the sample incorrectly thought that someone can prevent getting hep B or giving it to others by not drinking alcohol, exercising, avoiding sharing eating utensils with someone infected with hep B, making sure food or water is not contaminated and maintaining good hygiene. So now I'm gonna go through a little bit of the Chinese um, general community. Um, and their attitudes, similar data to what I've presented for the Vietnamese community. So this is just um, the demographics of the sample. Um, in terms of knowing someone with hep B, half the sample reported that they personally knew someone with hep B. Um, similar to the Vietnamese sample, 87% had received some information on hep B, and the sources were similar to the Vietnamese sample from the internet, newspaper magazines, and friends and colleagues. 72% of this sample reported being tested for hep B. As similar to the Vietnamese sample, testing was higher amongst those who completed the survey online. And the main reason given for testing was it was part of a regular health check. The most commonly reported place was at a clinic or hospital. And slightly less in the sample reported being either satisfied or very satisfied with the information they received about hep B when they were tested. The, the, the participants who had never been tested reported the same reason as the Vietnamese sample for not being tested, and that was that they were feeling quite well and did not feel a test was necessary. 60% reported being vaccinated for hep B. And again, this number was higher amongst participants who completed the survey online. Of those participants who reported being vaccinated, the majority, a big majority, 84% reported fully completing their vaccinations. And 43% had received their vaccinations in China, 41% had received them in Australia. 
In terms of health seeking behavior, so um, this was really interesting because of the, sam the um, sample of um, Ch Chinese people, we had 188 who reported to be living with Hep B. So this is just a little bit of, na of analysis from this sample. We're going to do substantially more analysis around this 188. Um, but of them, 92 participants saw their GP or specialist every six to 12 months for monitoring of their Hep B. Um, most of those doctors lived in Australia, um, and most of the doctors spoke both English and Chinese. So again, it speaks to the importance of having a, a, a health practitioner of a similar, similar cultural background. 76 um, participants were advised to take pharmaceutical medicine only. 48 were told to take traditional medicines, and 43 were told to take pharmaceutical and traditional Chinese medicines. They had the same concern as the Vietnamese group, that they were concerned um, about being isolated if they told people that they were living with Hep B. So this medical mistrust item again, um, it shows again a degree of mistrust in the medical health, Western medical health system. It's the same items. There are a fair number of people who, who chose neutral to neither disagree or, or agree. Um, but overall, there is some um, mistrust. And also, uh, the, there's an interesting item on um, um, understanding the root cause of, of Hep B that um, people felt was more of a traditional kind of understanding. Um, so um, in terms of attitudes towards Hep B, 40 of the 188 participants who have had Hep B have never experienced stigma or discrimination in relation to their Hep B. And 64 of these 188 participants reported that they had rarely experienced stigma or discrimination. However, when the entire sample was asked whether they would expect to experience stigma or discrimination, uh, only 15% responded that they would never expect to experience stigma or discrimination. 44% responded that they sometimes thought they would, and 13% um, thought that they would often experience stigma or discrimination. This is also similar to the Vietnamese sample. 64% felt that people who have Hep B should not be isolated by family and friends. So that's really good at 629 people. However, 35% reported that if they knew someone had Hep B, they would avoid close contact with them. 57, almost 58% felt that screening or testing for Hep B is necessary for job applications for the same reason as the Vietnamese sample, that it's to prevent transmission to other employees. And 11% or 109 participants agreed or strongly agreed that people who have Hep B should be ashamed of their illness. So again, there's some work to be done over there. In terms of knowledge of Hep B, this was similar. The findings were very mixed. Um, knowledge was inconsistent. So 74% knew that there was a vaccination that could prevent Hep B infection. Only 37% were aware that there were effective pharmaceutical medicines available to treat Hep B. While 77% knew that Hep B was a virus, 62% of the sample responded that Hep B was caused by poor sanitation and hygiene, contaminated food or water or utensils. And there were inaccurate assumptions around transmission of Hep B. 75% incorrectly thought that maintaining good hygiene could prevent transmission. 67% incorrectly thought that making sure food or water are not contaminated with Hep B can prevent transmission. 62% incorrectly thought that avoiding sharing eating utensils would avoid transmission. And 60% incorrectly thought that exercise can prevent transmission. So that's the quantitative data in a nutshell. And I'm sorry if I've kind of breezed over some of it. Um, I'm just aware of the time. And there's also the qualitative data to now talk about, which is I think in some ways more interesting, it's more in depth. Um, so what we did in this part, it's, it's a slightly different study where we did some qualitative interviews with students of Vietnamese and Chinese background and looked at their thoughts, knowledge and, and concepts of Hep B. So we interviewed um, 13 students of Vietnamese background and 10 students of Chinese background. They'd been in Australia from two months to 12 years. 
and their ages ran from, ranged from 19, 19 to 29 years. So um, firstly, let me acknowledge the other researchers that were involved in the qualitative research, because really I didn't have that much to do with this. So thanks to Joanne and Jake who are involved in this call um, and to our researchers of Chinese and Vietnamese background who did the interviews and helped with this interpretation. So one of the first things we looked at is concepts of health, because how people make sense of or understand their health is important um, because it understandings of health and illness are often culturally bound and can be understood in terms of one's own culture and frameworks that define the world. So participants were asked to describe what they understood health to be, to understand their beliefs and values around hep B. In general, in general participants described health in terms of physical and observable aspects of the body, such as balanced diet, minimal drinking and smoking during exercise. Mental or emotional aspects of health were given much less attention and the social determinants of health such as racism and poverty were not mentioned at all. So as participants said, for example, Vanny, I think a healthy person will be like doing exercise, regularly having meals regularly and eats more vegetables, like balance for each type of food and also sleep regularly at least six to eight hours a day. Yeah, I think that's a healthy person for me. Health was often judged based on externally observable factors, such as very good skin, having healthy gums and teeth. And health was also understood to be an individual's responsibility. So under the person's control for them to maintain through discipline and their ability to manage their daily routines. And then what this means for hep B, um, implications for hep B, um, because health was seen to be controllable, people were able, to, there's a sense that people will be able to adapt their own behavior if the correct messages are provided to them. That physical wellness amongst the sample is thought to matter more, which means mental and emotional aspects of hep B may be ignored. And healthcare seeking will be prompted by physical hep B symptoms, which you could see was similar to the quantitative data and comes out again later in the qualitative data. And so it's difficult to encourage people to get screened if they're asymptomatic. So the next thing we looked at was beliefs around hepatitis B. So similar to the quantitative data, people, participants were generally unsure about how hep B was spread. And the common belief was that it could be acquired through saliva by sharing food and cooking and eating utensils. This is very similar to what we found in the qualitative data and the quantitative data. Saliva was seen as a concern if a person was in close proximity, even if they were just sitting next to someone or eating next to someone who had hep B or talking with them, this was all seen as a risk. And as Melissa said, most commonly no way of contraction is through eating, through saliva. So people don't share food, don't eat in public, like if they know the person next to them is hepatitis B infected, they will not share the food or the utensils with that person through talking. Through talking because like saliva can be, you know, spit when you talk. Or as Lou said, I don't think people with hepatitis can actually be teachers or lecturer or speaker, public speaker, something like that, because you'll be talking a lot so people have a chance to touch your spit. So there were beliefs that hep B could be acquired through unhygienic food preparation, which suggests a confusion with hepatitis A. Some participants identified that hep B could be acquired intergenerationally, but they weren't quite sure how this transmission happened. Some identified that hep B could be transmitted through sexual relationships. And hep B, this was interesting, hep B was thought by many to be curable by Western medical techniques. So again, what does this mean for hep B prevention, testing and management? So it's important to develop help, health promotion messaging that improves specific aspects of knowledge, such as addressing the views that hep B is transferred through saliva or sharing eating utensils, clarifying the intergenerational transmission of hep B, that it's from maternal fetal transmission, um, addressing expectations about a hep B cure, that it's not curable, but poor health outcomes can be reduced through the right clinical care, 
and developing messages showing that sexual transmission can be prevented. So now I'm going to talk to you about our data on stigma, um, which was particularly interesting and really what we realized from this um, small study with international students is we have to do a whole lot more research to understand how stigma presents amongst culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Because what we found is that stigma may present differently amongst these participants. Um, participants noted that others, especially elder generation, held negative attitudes towards people with FB, even if they themselves didn't. And many were critical of those who held negative attitudes towards people with FB. So as Hong said, um, who didn't hold any negative attitudes, as far as I'm concerned, that disease is not infectious. So there's nothing for me to worry about. I will be more like paying attention to him or more giving kindness to him, giving help, giving help, giving a hand to him. I would not be like discriminate him. But then as Tran pointed out, the older generation have different understandings. And they probably think that the person has been doing something dodgy that he'd been using drugs or been involved with sex workers or generally not a bad impression, not a good impression on that person, a negative view of that person, they probably had a pretty bad view on that person. So it also wasn't seen as stigma by a number of participants, but rather that people were being cautious and it was more about protecting oneself than about having negative attitudes towards other people. As Arn said, Vietnam is like quite oppressive. So I think older people, like my parents, they usually scare me and my older brother to get any disease. And then they will always ask us to protect ourselves and don't try to contact with other people who have diseases, such as a flu or something like this. They ask us, try to avoid, because we are studying abroad and we need to protect ourselves first rather than trying to understand people. So I thought that was a really interesting quote. So what does this mean for hep B management? Well, besides from the fact that we need to do a whole lot more um, research and develop a bit a more thorough understanding of how stigma manifests for people from these communities, um, we also know that better knowledge about transmission and prevention will reduce negative perceptions and then will reduce the tendency to isolate from others. So knowing that people aren't going to get hep B by sitting next to someone who has hep B or by talking to someone who has hep B. Um, because for the most part, hep B is not really viewed as a product of immoral behavior, there may be less stigma attached to it. And what we did find and what's really interesting and, you know, would have to be looked at again in each of the different communities that we work with, the word stigma may not have the same meaning and traction in Chinese and Vietnamese communities as it has um, for us. And there may not be a difference between stigma and discrimination in the same way that we understand the difference in English between stigma and discrimination. So this is the last set of slides. So, I'm, so one of the other things we asked about is understandings of testing and care. And one of the key things that came out of this is that the Australian health system is quite different to healthcare provision in home countries. So, you know, once we expand the study to look at other communities, we'll probably have similar kind of um, differences between our Australian health system and other systems um, internationally. So what participants felt is that the Australian system was high quality and provides fair access, but can be overly complex to access, can be expensive and is not amenable to out of hours care. Um, again, hep B testing was thought to only be necessary if a person has symptoms. And even though some participants knew that hep B could be asymptomatic, a common view was that testing and clinical care only happened after the development of symptoms. So what are the implications of this last little section for hepatitis B prevention, testing and management? Um, we need to improve awareness about at the asymptomatic nature of hep B and therefore the importance of getting tested even with no symptoms. And we have to improve knowledge about various access points for hepatitis B healthcare in the Australian um, community. And given that the medical system here can be a little bit cumbersome and difficult to understand. And that's the end of the presentation. I just want to acknowledge our funders, the Commonwealth Department of Health, all our big, our big advisory group that we've got, and especially thank you to our researchers of Vietnamese and Chinese background, Koi Vu, Feng Jin, Eric Wu, and Shakira Yuan, and to our, the rest of our team, um, just to acknowledge them as well. So thanks, everyone.
Thanks, Lauren. Um, great to see that data coming out. Some fascinating stuff in there. Um, so we're going to hand over now to Professor Carla Trimble, who's going to present um, a very interesting output from a, a study. Um, uh, well, Carla, I'll just hand over to you. Why don't you describe it? Thanks, Carla. Okay, getting there with the slide. I want to um, talk about this project. Well, and stop sharing the window. Wouldn't you know it. This project that was funded by an ARC grant and led by La Trobe University, the Archers, the Australian Research Centre for Sex, Health and Society. And our centre was a partner on that project. And we, um, in this project, spoke to a number of people, 50 people across New South Wales and Victoria living with uh, Hep C and produced this output, Vital Voices on Hep C. Um, please go and have a look at it. It's a resource for people living with, for health workers, for uh, family and friends, media, to kind of capture the range of experiences of people um, through diagnosis and particularly treatment and cure. So there are in this um, website, there is uh, people's um, exact wording drawn from interviews with uh, in audio and, and in video, depending on people's the interview participants preferences on that. Uh, so just a brief plug on this, please go check it out, use it in um, whatever way uh, make sense for the types of work you do. And on the left hand side, there's other um, related projects which has used similar methods, uh, one around um, lives of substance around people who use drugs and the second around overdose. So I'll end that plug there and hand back. Thanks, Carla. Um, and just a reminder, it does look like we might have a few minutes for questions at the end of the session. So if you do have any questions, you can um, save them and put your hand up at the end, or you can put them in the chat and, um, and I, can, um, I can read them out at the end. Um, so we're going to finish up today with um, the launch of the um, ARTB, the um, Annual Report of Trends in Behavioral Behavior Viral Hepatitis Edition. Uh, and we're going to do a bit of tag team between uh, Jake and myself. Um, I'll just raise a finger if you like, Joanne, when I'm ready for the next slide. Uh, okay, let's try that. I'm just um, trying to share my screen here. Um, so is that in full screen view yep perfect okay all right off you go then jake thanks thank you very much joanne um so welcome to the 2022 launch of our annual report of trends in behavior for viral hepatitis so given the brief time I have available, I've chosen to highlight just four areas of our work from uh, the last year. So over the last few years, our work has paid increasing attention to the social and cultural context of hepatitis B. One of the key challenges for Australian governments with their focus on Western biomedical approaches to hepatitis B is to recognize and navigate the various cultural structures and values of communities affected by hepatitis B. This might include, for example, the different ways in which affected communities understand concepts of health and bodies, the cultural meanings and values ascribed to hepatitis B, and the challenges people living with the virus may have in accessing and navigating the Australian healthcare system. Social science approaches are well equipped to investigate these areas and underscore why the Centre's ongoing work in this area is so critical.
So in Australia, as elsewhere, the curative potential of new hep C therapies has inspired a reconceptualization of the public health approach. We've moved from one of prevention and chronic disease management to one of population level treatment as prevention and viral elimination. A key focus of the center's work in the post interferon era is a critical interrogation of these concepts and their translation into practice, both in the community and in custodial set settings. In one such example, we conducted a qualitative sub-study as part of Australia's recently completed Stop C project. Stop C, or the Surveillance and Treatment of Prisoners with Hepatitis C study, was the world's first trial of hepatitis C treatment as prevention in prison. Our sub-study drew on in-depth interviews conducted with people in prison, health and custodial staff, and key policymakers to explore their attitudes towards treatment as prevention in prison, especially in the absence of adequate primary prevention. More broadly, however, while acknowledging the promise of Australia's new era of DAA therapies and universal access, we continue to stress the need to update and revise approaches to prevention. As Tim has just elaborated, in 2021, the Stigma Indicators Project continued to monitor the experience of stigmatization amongst priority populations, producing new and compelling data on which to build interventions. Our next challenge will be to better understand how stigma functions within communities affected by hepatitis B. Accounting, as, as Lauren touched on, for the specific cultural values, knowledges, and contexts that produce stigma and importantly, how these intersect with racism. Next slide, please, Lauren. Uh, Joanne. Excellent. Um, so as we're all more than aware, COVID-19 continued to affect all aspects of our lives and research over the last year. In terms of the pandemic itself, much of the existing literature has tended to emphasize the particular vulnerabilities of marginalized communities. While acknowledging this, our study was also careful to identify how affected communities cared for and protected themselves against the threat of COVID, and to identify the opportunities, innovations and adaptations that arose out of changes to harm reduction and drug treatment service provision. Final slide, please. So thank you. This really has been a whistle-stop tour, but please check out our report for a comprehensive coverage of all our work over the last year. Thank you. Thank you, Jake. Um, and thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we do have uh, a few minutes now um, at the end of the session, uh, if there are any questions. So I'm just having a look in the chat. Uh, and there is a question from uh, Gabrielle, who asks, hi, Gabrielle. <laughs> um, did you want to ask your question, Gabrielle, or would you prefer me? Oh, to no, I'm, I'm happy to ask it. it. Yeah. Um, thanks, Joanne. Thanks, Lauren. That was a great um, presentation. Um, and it highlighted to me that we've got a lot further to go than I thought we might have in Hep B. Um, <clears throat> I think um, part of my work is providing professional development on Hep B to clinicians. Um, and I always feel like I have to sneak in information about cross-cultural communication, um, health beliefs models, even just working with interpreters. Um, obviously, clinicians are really busy. Uh, there's a lot of health issues they need to know about, but it's really challenging to get um, most clinicians, not all, um, interested in these aspects so that, you know, people can actually leave the consult and understand what is going on and what they need to do. Um, so any um, tips or clues on <laughs> how we can encourage, you know, uh, clinicians to build more skills in this area? I think that is that a question for you, Laura? 
I was wondering. <laughs> go for it. I mean, I'm happy to try a go, but anyone who feels that they want to jump in, then please go ahead and jump in. Um, you know, what we can offer really is the research that can um, point to how beneficial it is to have um, a broad understanding and cultural knowledge when working with people from culturally and linguistically diverse communities. So I guess it is difficult, it can be difficult providing that information to clinicians to get them to kind of stop and, and take an assessment of it. Um, but the more we can produce information and research around that, the more, I guess, ammunition you guys will have to assist you um, in developing those um, educational campaigns. Um, we are going to be launching a study at our next phase of the stigma indicators we research is to look at the Korean and Filipino communities. Um, so we should hopefully have some information out about that um, next year. Um, but again, if anyone else feels that they have, um, would like to respond to Gabrielle, um, then please jump in. I mean, I, th I think one of the interesting things um, that is different in relation to hepatitis B that we, that we see a lot in hepatitis C is that there's not the same kind of um, uh, workforce organization. So it's not the same kind of networking of peer workers, for example, as you see um, in, in relation to the hep C workforce, there's not the same kind of strong advocacy uh, and those, those two things, clinicians listen to that sort of stuff. I mean, especially, you know, cl clinicians are certain, the research on clinicians anyway, the research that I know about, you know, clinicians care about stigma. They really do. Um, it, it's just about whether um, uh, the, the voices are loud enough, I suppose. And that's what, you know, that needs support for hepatitis B. Uh, certainly, it's having a sector that's organized that can do that advocacy um, strongly in the same way that we get in relation to HEPI. Does anyone else want to comment on that? We um, do have one question for Tim, but I'm not sure if anyone else wants to comment on that question from Gabrielle. I've been asked to present to a group of doctors in a couple of weeks, and um, it's about it's called hepatitis, not just a physical disease. So I'm really excited um, and hope to use some of your research. <laughs> uh, I, I'd add one thing, Gabrielle. I totally hear what you're saying, and it's such a complex area to walk into, right? So there's other things that we can draw on. You know, the census that was released recently showing the... Um, the importance of people who come from a different country, which most of us have, um, but particularly with different cultural beliefs around health, those kind of bigger picture things might be persuasive to say this is now kind of mainstream work for health services is to, to service properly all of the community and the community is diverse. So what do you need? What resources do you need to work best and most efficiently with people from a range of different backgrounds that you don't share? Yeah, thank you. Now there was a question from Adrian, or Adrian, you had your hand up um, and your camera on. Would you like to ask your question Hi, or Lee. comment? Yes. Um, sorry. <laughs> Hi, I'm Adrian. I'm from Diversity Hub. Just regarding Gabriel's uh, question, actually, we do a bit of cultural support. Uh, for CALD communities. Uh, we do have a hepatitis uh, topics on that. So uh, if you want to know a bit more about like how our cultural support workers um, promoting the uh, health promotion in CALD communities, uh, probably you can contact me for a bit more details and uh, I'll refer it to my manager managers or senior staff here. I'm just junior staff, actually. I'm not talking to represent for the whole diversity hub. And uh, another thing is, when you talk about clean, uh, clinicians, um, actually, I think uh, to raise the awareness of hepatitis in care communities, um, it's not only about uh, clinicians, it's also about the care communities. So our cultural support workers 
we work differently from interpreters. We don't do that sort of interpreting because interpreters, they need to, uh, they have their working criteria. They have to stick to their um, ethics. They can't put extra in their translating, you know, but cultural support workers uh, provide uh, in language and culturally appropriate support to Celt communities that may be help to the communities uh, need to have more awareness of hepatitis. Just some ideas from me. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Adrian. Those are excellent ideas. And, and that's the kind of work that um, we have ahead of us is that sort of organization work, networking uh, communities together um, and networking peer workers together. Um, are there any other questions? Uh, I can see that there's some comments coming through um, uh, from Maddie, who, who works with First Nations clients and, talk, and mentioned the value of images and visual care plans, uh, which sounds excellent. Um, and there was actually a question from Razine who asks uh, a question of Tim asking if there is any data um, on this stigma indicator survey about men who have sex with men uh, yeah. on hepatitis C treatment and care. Um, so yeah, we do have data um, related to men who have sex with men. Um, as I briefly mentioned at the beginning, it's a much broader project. So as well as looking at hepatitis B, hepatitis C, injecting drug use, we also have um, arms of data collection looking at HIV, um, men who have sex with men, sex workers, um, and STIs um, as kind of the main focus groups um, that we collect data on. So there are, yeah, there are separate data sets for each of those. Um, and yeah, we have brief summaries up on the, the project website on the CSRH uh, website where there's a, kind of that overarching findings from the most recent rounds of all of those different um, surveys. Uh, in terms of hepatitis treatment and care, um, we do have some, but we, do, we don't specifically ask for about stigma in relation to treatment, um, but you know, we do ask questions around whether people have access treatment, um, not a huge amount of detail, but some where we can look at the relationships between stigma and accessing treatment and healthcare. Um, and some of what I showed on the, the last slide kind of um, taps into that a bit where we, you know, we from a, a few of our different surveys, we do see a bit of a relationship where people uh, tend to avoid healthcare when they have been more frequently stigmatised um, and you know, the, avoiding whether it's testing, treatment. Um, you know, we know from a wide body of research, not just our own, that stigma undermines absolutely every step of that healthcare process, every step of the cascade. So, um, yeah, we have some data that speaks into that, but there's also a much wider um, body of literature that uh, talks into that as well. Mm. Thanks, Tim. Um, all right, so are there any other questions from uh, the group? Uh, so what we might do actually is close. We've got one minute left. So um, thank you for joining us today. I'll um, encourage you to have a look at the center's website where you can find more information on um, some of the stuff that's presented today, although some of it's pretty recent, uh, but will be available over the next few months. Um, and also, um, I'd like to encourage you to uh, have a look at Hepatitis Australia's website. They've got a list of all the um, World Hepatitis Day events happening this week.